I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Welcome everyone, I'm Larry Moan, President of the Manhattan Institute. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, one of the pleasures of my job is that I get to interact with some of the most interesting people in the world, and that is especially true tonight. We are honored to have Nathan Glazer, one of America's greatest public intellectuals, here with us tonight to introduce his friend and Harvard colleague, Ed Glazer. As most of you know, Nat grew up in East Harlem in the Bronx, the son of working class Jewish immigrants. He attended City College in the 1940s and became part of the group of New York intellectuals, including Irving Howe, Daniel Bell, and Irving Crystal, who would meet in an alcove of the CCNY cafeteria to, quote, argue the world, as the recent PBS documentary put it. His career highlights are too many to go into in any detail, but I will mention a few briefly. He is the former co-editor of the enormously influential Public Interest magazine, a former assistant editor at Commentary, and a past professor of sociology at the University of California at Berkeley. He has served on presidential task forces on education and urban policy and the National Academy of Sciences Committees on Urban Policy and Minority Issues. His many famous books include The Lonely Crowd, Beyond the Melting Pot, and The Limits of Social Policy. Now was also a formative influence on the Manhattan Institute and served as an early trustee and a frequent contributor to City Journal. Today, from his perch at Harvard and through his writing in the New Republic and other prestigious venues, he continues to inform the debate over issues on race, immigration, urban development, and social policy. What I admire most about Nat, besides his formidable intellect, is his insatiable curiosity and enthusiasm for the world that he lives in. Please join me in welcoming America's premier social scientist, a true scholar and gentleman, Nathan Glazer. Well, it gives me great pleasure to <laughs> introduce uh, Edward Glazer for the talk he will give, I assume based on his uh, new book, The Triumph of the City. Uh, Edward Glazer is a, uh, no relative, uh, different Glazer, is a phenomenon in the world of urban economics and not only in the world of urban economics. Uh, some of you may know of his work uh, from reading the City Journal, where he's had a number of uh, very provocative and interesting articles, such as his article on uh, uh, Houston, New York has a problem, on uh, why is Houston, which most of us will not, do not think that well of, why does it work so well, and why is it uh, so much cheaper to live in than New York, or his piece on Buffalo, uh, which deals with the problems of upstate New York cities and where he takes the position, which is not uh, the most popular one, that we should not be pouring more money into their infrastructure and buildings. We should just try to help their people realize their prospects more effectively. Uh, but these articles give the merest hint of the range of his work and accomplishment. Since 1992, when he came to Harvard as a professor, just after receiving his doctoral degree in economics from the University of Chicago, he has published, I see from his Vita, some 90 articles in research journals, a phenomenal record, many chapters and books, many other articles in newspapers and more accessible journals like the City Journal, and just last week in uh, an interesting article in the Boston Globe. Uh, and he has also edited a half dozen books and written a few himself. Economists, as you, know, as you may know, in contrast to other social scientists, typically publish their work in the form of articles and research papers, and frequently through books, something like physicists. Now, but now Edward has written a book 
bringing together many of his observations on cities, and it is a very good book indeed. Edward Grazer has written on crime, corruption, poverty, and other subjects, but his focus remains on the city. And this focus has been shaped by being born and raised in New York City. In the East 60s, not so far from here, as he tells us at one point in his new book, The Triumph of the City. He was and is a true walker in the city, noticing everything, learning from what he sees. And when he thinks about what makes cities great, what makes them grow, and what makes them decline, he seems always to be looking from the perspective of New York City, which he knows so well, and how it shaped his knowledge and appreciation and love for cities. His hypotheses often come from his experience of New York, but they are then defended with observations on many cities, with numbers behind them. You will be impressed, as I was, at how many cities, if you read this book, he seems to know intimately in all parts of the world, and how often he can defend his observations with quantification with numbers, as economists want to do. And so I hope when you look at the book, you'll also sometimes check the footnotes, which are not real footnotes, but just uh, listed in the back according to pages. But despite Edward Glazer's formation as an economist, his hero, a heron, as you will see from the book, is Jane Jacobs. And this does raise a few interesting questions, which I hope will come up. Now, how could she not be a heroine for a lover of New York? There are more references to Jane Jacobs in the book than any other individual figure. This may be surprising in an, econo in an economist. Uh, Jane Jacobs was no economist or any other kind of social scientist. And a good number of professional economists would look askance and not take seriously her books on the economics of cities, which I believe Edward does take seriously. Uh, Jane Jacobs, but more than just another observer of the city. She had remarkably astute ideas about how cities work and succeed, and Edward has put solid numbers behind some of them. But he does not go all the way with Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs appreciated and celebrated the unplanned diversity that emerges from the accumulation of the decisions of individual builders, entrepreneurs, residents, shopkeepers, and the innovations that are created by this mixture. This process makes the kind of city that Jane Jacobs loved and that Edward Glazer loves. But these spontaneous aspects of cities that Jane Jacobs and other city lovers appreciate are not easy to create and to maintain and Edward Glazer's had to update Jane Jacobs in ways she might not recognize or approve of. I won't go into the details. That is for the book, which I hope you will all read if you haven't. I hope these issues will come out when Edward talks about his new book and when we talk about it with him. Thank you. I, ha I have admired uh, Nathan Glazer uh, since I was um, a, a teenager, and I was just telling him that when I was 14, my mother, who's actually in the audience, told me that, well, as I was reading Beyond the Melting Pot, well, you know, Pat Moynihan only wrote the chapter about the Irish, and uh, Nat, Nat, Nat Glazer is responsible for the, for the rest. So I, I couldn't be more honored than to be introduced by, by Nathan Glazer. I also couldn't be more honored to begin my book-related events at a Manhattan Institute event. I have admired Manhattan Institute since its inception. I have learned from, from the work that it has put forward. It has always created a, just an enormously clear thinking approach to cities and their problems that combines a passion for our urban areas with a desire to actually get things right and to clear away the myths that so often obfuscate good policy. Um, the, um, my own, the process of working on this book has been greatly aided uh, by the nurturing that I've received by the Manhattan Institute and by City Journal. And uh, I couldn't be more grateful to Larry Moan and Brian Anderson and to everyone at, at MI who, who helped make this happen. Um, events of the last week 
scary as they are, uh, terrifying as they are, reinforce a central point. The world is being remade by its cities. And as much as the revolution in Tunisia and the ongoing chaos, the ongoing disorder in Cairo is called uh, the Facebook or Twitter revolution, let's not forget that it's fundamentally an urban phenomenon, that it's fundamentally about the same ability of cities to transform the countries that they, that they have. And whatever happens from this, and I think I'm as, as scared as many other people are, are in this room, it reminds us of how important cities are and how important we have to understand, how important it is to try and understand them. Um, because in fact, I think the, the future of the world depends upon it. So let me start with a central paradox, which is that we live in a world in which distance is dead, in which it's effortless to email or telecommute across, uh, across oceans and continents. That death of distance should have eliminated the need to locate cheek by jowl in urban areas. We were told 15 years ago that everyone would be telecommuting in from rural Montana and no one would need to put up with the inconveniences of the New York subway. And yet that's not what happened. Along so many dimensions, cities are more successful, more vital, more important than ever. And in many senses, it seems that technology is actually only making cities more critical, just as, in fact, Facebook and Twitter made the revolutions that actually happened in cities more, uh, more likely. Urban resurgence is visible in high incomes, high housing prices, and indeed, it's evident in the way that places like New York are weathering the storms of this recession. Right? This recession should have absolutely decimated the city, and yet our unemployment rate is a full point below the national average, and yet our housing prices have declined uh, by less than, than the nation. Indeed, you know, almost a tenth of the nation's GDP happens in New York, and if the rest of the country could rise to New York's level of productivity, national GDP would go up by 43%. The gulf between New York's productivity and that of the nation is, is so large. The three largest uh, metropolitan areas in the country produce fully a fifth of its uh, national product while containing only 13% of its population. Across countries, the rise of the city is even more clear. What you're looking at is the relationship between urbanization and income across places in, in the world. And it remains a fact that there's essentially no such thing as a wealthy rural nation. And there's no such thing really as an extremely poor urban nation. It's not that all of these places should be pushing more people in, into, this, into their cities. I, I share Nat, uh, I share Jane Jacobs' belief in, in you know, the importance of individual freedoms to make these choices. But cities are a critical part of the development process. It's impossible to imagine places like China and India becoming wealthy if they remain mired in, in, in their farms and in their, in their villages. Gandhi very much argued that the future of India was in its farms and villages, but the great man was wrong. In fact, the future of India is in places like this, in, in Bangalore, where sleek uh, modern uh, campuses, like the Mind Tree campus, are the gateways between India and the rest of the world. They're places where ideas and markets come together uh, and enable India to join in the, the global marketplace of, of ideas and goods. Um, there are also, of course, places that face tremendous challenges. That's, that's Bangalore outside of Mind Tree's elegant, uh, elegant campus. And as you can see, it's a city that isn't always, always paved and still has enormous problems. Those problems are indeed the, will be the central problems of the 21st century for much of the developing world. Um, this is nothing new. Cities' abilities to create miraculous connections across oceans and continents is, has long been with us. The top, of course, is Raphael School of Athens, itself an example of how cities can create great art. But even more so, it illustrates what was happening in Athens in the fifth century, where a city flush with military victory and economic success welcomed in the greatest minds of the Greek world. And that set of Greek minds then set about, which came from places like Miletus in, in Ionia, came about educating Athenians like Socrates, people like Hippodamus came in and brought uh, urban planning to Athens. It was a place where knowledge from around the world came and people then became educated by that knowledge and created the wonders of the classical world that are still with us. Below it is Nagasaki, which was the uh, channel through which Dutch knowledge made it into Japan and made it possible for Japan to catch up so quickly uh, with European nations. Um, of course, the relationship between urbanization and, and wealth is not just true across, uh, across countries. It's true within the United States as well, and there's been a vast amount of research on this. What you're looking at here is the relationship between metropolitan area uh, population and the amount of productivity per worker. Cities are just far more productive than low-density areas. And 
if we think about how America is going to get its economic mojo back, about how we're going to recover, it's important to remember that cities will surely play a vital role in that, and that we actually have to rethink those policies which artificially handicap uh, urban areas while doing so. Now, this relatively bright picture of cities today is so different than the, the New York of my youth, right? These are, of course, iconic images from New York of the 1970s when I was a kid growing, growing up here. And um, it's, in some sense, absolutely amazing that cities have been able to come back. And I, I want to just take you a little, on a little bit of a historical det detour to remind ourselves how we got there and then talk about how we came back from, from this. So New York, like all of America's older, colder cities, is made by waterways. Every one of the 20 largest American cities in 1900 was on a major waterway, often in a place where the river meets the sea. New York City's greatest period of growth occurred between 1800 and 1850 when the city exploded as the hub of a great hub-and-spoke shipping system, which connected uh, the East Coast to the, to the world. Um, New York's great manufacturing industries of the 19th century were built around those waterways. Sugar refining, which came about because raw sugar was being shipped in through New York and created the foundation of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's family fortune. Um, the garment trade, of course, great amount of textiles always coming, already coming through New York and a great market for ready-made clothes. And of course, printing and publishing. It's important to remember that the big money in 19th century printing and publishing was in pirated English novels like Peveril of the Peak, which Harper Brothers managed to bring to market much faster than their Philadelphia competitors, Carrie and Lee. Harper Brothers were able to perform that feat because the ships got to New York first, because New York had the harbor. And that harbor then created the transfer of ideas that then enabled our great publishers in the 19th century. And you know, let's be honest, Anything that happens in Japan, these guys, it happens in China with, with intellectual property uh, theft, they had nothing on what was happening in, in uh, New York in the 19th century. But these waterways created these great industries. Likewise, waterways were the starting point for Chicago's greatness. Chicago is the linchpin of a great watery arc which s goes all the way from New York to, to New Orleans. Right? During the 1830s, as the Illinois and Michigan Canal was being finished, Chicago was already seen to be a place that clearly was going to be the gem of the, of the prairie. Railroads only came to supplement that. And the great industries that came to Chicago, like the stockyards that you're, of course, seeing, were places that had a natural logic. In the 19th century, it was incredibly difficult to move goods across space within the US. It cost more to move goods 32 miles across land in 1816 than it did to ship them across the Atlantic which is why, of course, the population perched on the edge of the, of the eastern seaboard. The great triumph of the, of the 19th century was to create a transportation network that enabled the great fruits of the American hinterland, the corn grown by Iowa farmers that was then you know, turned into pigs, which, of course, are really corn in porcine form, and shipped, uh, shipped east. Innovations followed. Cows, of course, required that, you know, that great innovation of, of refrigerated uh, train cars, which the great idea, of course, was putting the ice on the top instead of on the bottom so the cold water drips down, wouldn't seem to be so, so brilliant a, a, uh, an insight, but yet it was absolutely crucial. Um, these waterways, this transportation technology gave these cities a great, great advantage. And then, of course, the cities did amazing things, uh, starting at that base. What you're looking at, of course, is Henry Ford, and the, the thing next to it is Detroit Dry Dock. Detroit in the early 1900s looked a lot like Silicon Valley did in the 1970s. There was an entrepreneur on every street corner. They stole from each other. They supplied each other. They financed each other. It was the model of a small firm productive, uh, productive cities. And it was a natural place to do cars because they came together two technologies, one of which was engines. Detroit had engines because it was a great inland port and because the young Henry Ford learned his engine skills working at Detroit Dry Dock. It also had carriages because of the wood made in Michigan. Cars are carriages plus engines. Detroit was a natural place to do it. Unfortunately, this is what Detroit Dry Dock looks like today. You can still go there. I, I went there as part of my research on the book. There's no people there, really. It's just a giant, empty hull. And that's, in some sense, the tragic story of Detroit, that this amazing innovation, uh, the mass-produced automobile that came out of the rich urban structure of, of Detroit ended up producing something that was very harmful uh, to cities. On some sense level, the industrial city was a mistaken detour for urban, for urban life. If you go back to the 18th century cities, think about Alexander Hamilton's New York. It's a city defined by smart people, small firms, and global connections. 
That's, those are still defining characteristics for successful cities today. But the industrial city became built around vast, wholly integrated firms that provided employment for less skilled people. Much of that is, is something to be admired, but it ended up proving to be a, a really bad dead end uh, for cities as a whole. Um, moreover, the car was, of course, associated with this incredible revolution in transportation costs. That what you're looking at is the cost of moving a ton of mile by rail over the 20th century. And as you can see, this cost declined by 90% or more. Whereas in 1900, it was incredibly expensive to move goods over space, and the places like Chicago and like Detroit that had an edge in inland transportation could benefit from that. By 1970, those cost advantages had disappeared, and these cities had lost their raison d'etre. As a result, almost all of these older, colder cities declined. And it's worthwhile remembering that the decline in transportation costs and the globalization that came with it hit New York just as badly as it hit Detroit. Right, the largest industrial cluster in this country in the 1950s was not automobiles in Detroit. It was the garment production here in New York, decimated, of course, by, by the globalization. Of course, we still produce plenty of fashion ideas here, but we don't necessarily, we don't need to make them here. Um, what happened as a result of the decline in transportation costs? A tremendous move towards warmer states, also abetted by political changes, the great improvements in politics in, in, uh, in southern states, the introduction of right to work laws, and of course, what a heat bias technological change, things that made it bearable to imagine living in South Carolina 12 months out of, out of the year. No variable better predicts urban growth over the 20th century than January temperature, which is a tough fact for us to pay attention to given the weather that we're currently uh, experiencing. Experiencing. Uh, and this, of course, also hit uh, New York and every one of the older, colder cities. But there were other things that also went along with this move that also changed urban form and made things hard for the New York of my youth, one of which, of course, was the move to car-based living. The top uh, picture is Levittown, one of the early uh, mass-produced suburbs. The bottom is the woodlands in Texas, a more modern, uh, more luxurious version. But America rebuilt itself around, around the car, um, there are e obvious reasons for that. The average commute by car in this country is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transportation is 48 minutes. This graph shows the relationship between the share of the population using public transit and average travel time to work. I believe it is certainly possible in dense cities to have short, pleasant commutes, but they certainly weren't there in the, in the, 19, in the 1970s, and that also pushed the move out. Cities are always formed around the transportation technology that's dominant during the era in which they're, they're built. As a result, urban decline was ubiquitous. What you're looking at here is the 10 largest cities in the US as of 1950. Eight of the 10 have significantly less population than they did in, in 60 years ago. Three of them have essentially lost half or more of their populations. Cleveland, Detroit, St. Louis, decimated by population loss, by both suburbanization made possible by the car and the larger tectonic shifts and the decline of their, of their industries. Um, these changes, seemed to call out for massive public intervention, especially since they were associated with tremendous uh, political and social chaos that followed along with the economic decline. This is, of course, a picture of Detroit's 1967 riot that destroyed more than 2,000 buildings. Um, the unfortunate thing is that the US government was set up to invest in physical, not human capital. The unfortunate thing is that the government was ready to sign huge checks for transportation or public housing, but it wasn't ready to invest in people. And in fact, it's people, not structures, that are at the real heart of any city. And declining cities are practically defined by having an excess of structures and infrastructure relative to the level of demand and the level of people. Look at, look at Detroit. There's the people mover, right? A $300 million boondoggle. It glides you know, smoothly over empty streets. Detroit did not need a monorail. Uh, it's not Disneyland. Uh, it, in fact, needed better schools. It needed safer streets. It needed some care to be put on its children. And yet, our public policies went in exactly the wrong, uh, the wrong direction on this. What's the right direction? Private entrepreneurship. Smart people learning from one another. Human capital. This is a picture, of course, of the bullpen in City Hall. It's a picture that, in some sense, symbolizes what New York does so well. And it, it reminds us of, this, of the story of Michael Bloomberg, who's such a, you know, a great figure illustrating not in his role as a, as a mayor, although I have certainly have enormous respect for him as a mayor, but in his role as a private entrepreneur, what happened in New York. And if we think about the sort of reinvention of New York, it gives us hints about what happened in, in American cities more, uh, more broadly. So New York, above all, still today, despite the crash, is, is dominated by a single industry. 42% of payroll in the island of Manhattan is associated with uh, finance and insurance. 
That industry, of course, is in New York because the fundamental advantage of cities today is that they spread information more quickly, is that they speed the flow of ideas. And there is no industry where having the best knowledge is more valuable than finance. So it's very, very natural, of course, that finance is in, uh, is in New York. But New York's financial-led uh, rebirth was also associated with a chain of ideas where each new innovation built on another one. These chain of ideas are part of urban history. They show up again and again, and they often make absolutely miraculous things. I mean, if you think about Renaissance painting in Italy, right, it's a chain. It starts where Brunelleschi understands uh, linear perspective. He passes it along to his friend Donatello, who puts it on low relief uh, sculpture on the, on the wall of uh, Orsan Michele, who passes it along to Masaccio, who puts it in the Brancacci Chapel, who passes it along to that less than saintly monk, Fra Filippo Lippi, who passes it along to Botticelli, and so forth. A chain, each person riffing on the, uh, on the other. Now, it may seem slightly sacrilegious, but I kind of see the same thing in 1970s finance in New York, uh, where, you know, I guess Milken plays, I don't know, Botticelli. Um, but there's a greater understanding of how to think about the trade-off between risk and return. Some of this comes from the academy. Uh, some of it from at the University of Chicago. It's carried by people like Jack Trainer and Fisher Black to, to New York. That increasingly sophisticated understanding of how to trade off risk and return then makes it easy for the young Mike Milken to convince investors that his high yield debt is offering relatively good returns for the risk involved. Then, this, then the, an, another innovation, Milken's high yield debt, then makes it possible for Henry Kravis to engage in leverage buyouts and change corporate governance. Bloomberg is part of this chain, and so is Lou Ranieri in, his, in, the more, in the securitization revolution, which also depends upon a, a more sophisticated ability to think about risk and return. Bloomberg is my favorite example because he actually shows the sort of magic of cities at its, at its best. He is an information technology entrepreneur, but he comes out of finance, and he has the knowledge to be an entrepreneur in, in information technology because he borrows it from finance. He, of course, runs the trading floor in Solomon Brothers in the 1970s. He gets banished in, a, in an office coup to the back office where he learns about technology, then gets fired or pushed out, um, and then becomes an entrepreneur and borrows that knowledge in order to create data tools which are yet another chain in this, in this innovation. No Silicon Valley software engineer would have known what the guys at Merrill Lynch wanted the way that Mike Bloomberg did. And that ability to um, bring that knowledge is really crucial. The, the reason why I like the bullpen so much is that it sort of illustrates cities writ small, that cities at their best are about the exchange of knowledge. And the remarkable things about bullpens or trading floors trading floors in particular, is that here are some of the richest people on the planet who are foregoing the luxuries of a vast protected office to get the advantage of being right on top of each other, to get the advantage of actually getting the latest information. And that's what cities do. That's what makes cities magical. And that's the larger picture here, is that new technologies and globalization didn't kill New York. Because what they did, what all these changes have done, is they've increased the returns to being smart. They've increased the returns to innovation. And we are a social species, and our greatest asset is our ability to get smart by being around other people, is our ability to acquire information from the people around us. That's why we're fundamentally an urban species, because we actually are so good at taking advantage of the stream of knowledge that's, that's around us, and that's what makes New York tick. That the same density that once put hogsheads onto clipper ships now enables smart people to learn from one another and to borrow ideas and to create uh, marvelous innovations. And just think about the garment industry change as well. Sure. Production moved to China. But the fact that the costs of the industry are lower increases the returns to coming up with a great new handbag or a great new shoe design in New York. It actually helps the idea side of, of, of New York. A statistical footprint of the, the rise of, of the importance of ideas in cities is the incredibly important, incredibly strong connection between the skills of a city and its success. What you're looking at across um, across uh, these bars is the average growth rate by skill level across uh, metropolitan areas. And as you can see, across the overall population, there's a strong tendency the skilled places have just done much, much better than the less skilled places have done. Um, this relationship is far stronger in the Northeast and the Midwest. The previous one was for the full country. Now look, once you go down to the less skilled areas, you see very, very little growth. Among the most skilled cities, enormous growth. Skills begets success because density's ability to transfer knowledge has more value when you have more skilled, more educated people who bring more knowledge to begin with. There's a complementarity between cities and skills. What you're looking at here is the relationship between wages and skills across cities. And this is, this is really wonky uh, econ stuff, so you have to forgive me for one second. But what you're looking at is here is not average wages, but it's average wages controlling for individual characteristics like your own education. And what it shows is that controlling for your own level of education as the share of people in your area 
increases with college degrees increases by 10%, your wages go up on average by about 8%. People are just a lot more productive when they live in metropolitan areas surrounded by, by skilled people. Um, as much as it would be you know, nice to pretend that education itself is, is the critical element in human capital, certainly the more important things that are taught are the things that happen after school. And in a city like New York, which benefits from such an enormous entrepreneurial heritage, often be, begotten by the fact that the garment industry enabled people to have small startups, and you know, often garment uh, entrepreneurs would then go into totally different businesses, like A.E. Lefcourt, who's discussed in the, in the book, who built more skyscrapers than anyone else did prior to 1929, or have children who are entrepreneurial, like Sanford Weil, whose father was in the, uh, in the garment uh, manufacturing business. What you're looking at here is the relationship between at least one measure of entrepreneurship, average firm size, and subsequent growth. Places that look like Detroit, places that are mon dominated by a few large industries have done extremely poor, a few large firms have done extremely poorly. Places that are dominated by lots of small firms, have a real culture of entrepreneurship, have that kind of human capital, have done much, much better. Um, one of the, you know, signs of this process is also the fact that places that started with more skills have only become more skilled over time. So what you're looking at is the relationship between the share of the population with college degrees in 1940 and the growth in the share of the population with college degrees. Don't worry, my editor who's sitting there didn't let me put a single one of these graphs in the book. So you don't, this is your only exposure to, to it. Uh, but um, places that skilled people increasingly valued being around each other. And while that's great, it also makes me a little bit worried. Because one of the things that's so great about cities is that they've provided economic opportunity and a future for poorer people. And I worry about cities more, more like Boston than, than New York that are not managing to leave space for uh, the people who start with, with less. Um, indeed, one of the themes of the book is that, in fact, urban poverty is not something that cities should be ashamed of. That, in fact, cities have poor people, and they have, since Plato wrote 2,500 years ago, not because cities make people poor, but because cities attract poor people. Above all, they attract poor people with economic opportunity. These are, this is, by the way, a favela in Rio, which is sort of hard to look at here. I'll show you, show you Mumbai as well. They attract poor people with economic opportunity. In the U.S., they attract poor people with the ability to get around without a, a car for every adult. They, they, they attract poor people with appropriate housing stock and with all sorts of uh, social networks that, you know, couldn't have been better illustrated than by Nathan's, uh, Nathan Glazer's work on this. Of course, while it's a great thing that poor Indians are coming to cities like Mumbai, while it's a, it's a you know, hopeful sign for, for India, it also creates challenges, as indeed does all density. Right? The fact that I am close enough to, give, to exchange an idea with you also means that I'm close enough to give you a contagious disease. The fact that I can trade with you also means that I can rob you. Right? And these are the demons that come from density. Unfortunately, they're demons that require a lot of work. And in fact, it pains me to say it in my, in my libertarian heart, it also requires government, right? That in fact, it required battling the, the scourges of, of uh, unclean water in the 19th century required massive government spending. Cities were spending as much on water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for uh, the army and the post office. Sometimes I think those were the days, right? Uh, the, uh, the, you know, and, and these, these expenditures had, you know, had an enormous effect. This is a, a graph that the city of, Department of Health updates every, every year, and it shows the decline in, in mortality over the, over the 19th century. It required smart government of the right form to, to do it. But the attempts to do this privately, as you know, most famously came out of the collaboration between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr uh, to create the Manhattan Water Company, that didn't work, right? They produced a perfectly good bank, which of course the origins of Chase Manhattan Bank was the bank of the Manhattan Water Company, but they decided that actually providing clean water was kind of a low return activity. Uh, so they didn't actually engage in it, whereas Philadelphia that actually built its waterworks first had, had more success. Crime as well, right? It's not as if we think that you know, what happened in New York with the incredible fight against crime was a laissez-faire uh, triumph. It required good, strong government that, in fact, you know, City Journal was involved uh, with from the, from the beginning on this, that, in fact, fighting crime is obviously, you know, an absolute necessity only after providing clean water in terms of the things that city governments need to do. And finally, you know, uh, congestion is an issue. Um, what you're looking at, of course, is, is one of the densest countries on Earth and how quickly its cars move on relatively open streets despite all that density. It moves that way because they price roads, because they don't run a Soviet-style pricing system where they expect long queues and underpricing to actually ration a valuable product like access to city streets. Um, we can only hope that New York will once again uh, 
revisit this issue of actually using the market and using prices to actually allocate things. Now, what happened when uh, density's demons were relatively bested in New York is that the city flourished not just as a place of productivity, but a place of pleasure as well. That, in fact, the same things that make New York innovative, that make New York productive, also make the city fun. You know, it, it has a fantastic restaurant scene because of the entrepreneurship and spread of ideas in the city, urban scale of that specialization. Think about all those nail salons. Uh, activities with fixed costs like theaters and museums can be handled in, in, in uh, New York. Um, and, you know, it's just the spread of people, right? The city is full of young single people because when you're young and single, it's great to be around other young single people, and that's part of what the way cities work. Amenities matter. Right? Attracting amenities actually play a really important role in attracting people. And what you're looking at is the relationship between a, a simple amenity index that I put together in urban growth over the past 20 years. After small firm size and skills and sun, sunshine, these, the, um, the quality of life really matters. And while I could not be more skeptical about the ability of governments, whether local or national, to micromanage innovation and growth, it is the job of governments to actually make sure that the quality of life is decent. And when the demons of density are bested, cities have a tremendous ability to be fun uh, as well as productive. The downside of having rising economic productivity and a great quality of life is that this creates great demand for urban real estate. After all, you know, New York is, is a much better place to live in in lots of ways than it was in 1975, and the city has become more expensive. Now, the natural way to, so what you're looking at here, the triangles that are going up are prices. The, the odd thing, of course, about New York over the last 30 years until the Bloomberg administration when things started to tick up again was that the other line, the, the circles, are going down, okay? The circles are the production of new, new housing. We've made it increasingly difficult to build in this, in this city, both because of draconian zoning regulations and also because of the rise of, of large-scale historic preservation districts, which now occupy 15% of the land in new Manhattan south of 96th Street, excluding the parks, right? You can't repeal the laws of supply and demand. If you've got high demand for, for anything, and you don't allow supply to, to actually react. I mean, remember in the 1920s, when New York also had high demand, we were building 100,000 new units a year, okay? That kept prices low. This is, you know, uh, the important thing going, going forward. And New York has, uh, you know, cities, cities have created a manner of, of supplying new housing, even in dense areas, which is, which is going up. And I think as we look forward for the city, I think revisiting the, the ability of high-rise housing to deliver both affordable and pleasant products is, is really crucial. Chicago does it much better than we do. I mean, Chicago has stayed much more affordable because Daly has been such an enormous fan of building from the beginning. This is where Nat um, alluded. This is where I differ from Jane Jacobs. So Jane had two views on, on urban planning, both of which I take issue with, one of which was her uh, hagiography of old buildings. I like old buildings. I love old buildings. But Jane Jacobs' view was that actually keeping old buildings in place would actually make housing more affordable because she looked at the old buildings and the old buildings were cheap. That's not how supply and demand works. If you don't allow people to build, prices go up. Okay, and this is, you know, there she's making her, her my wife called it a cat face at these high-rise buildings, and certainly I am no, you know, pan, I, I am no Pollyanna about the incredible problems of high-rise public housing. Uh, but, you know, I grew up in relatively tall buildings. They always seem to work reasonably well to, to me. Um, and, you know, certainly lots of people live, live good productive lives uh, in them. Uh, it's not, and remember, you know, the, my view is certainly not that anyone should be forced to live in a high-rise high -rise building who doesn't want to. The goal is just getting government out of the way of the production of, of these things. Where there is demand, and there certainly is demand for them in New York, you just don't want the policies that actually go, go uh, impede people being free to choose what housing they want. This problem is even more severe in Mumbai, which, as the last curse of British colonialism, managed to impose very, very stringent floor area ratios, about one and a third throughout much of the city through a lot of the past decades. When New York you know, doesn't allow building, the city gets too expensive, and that's a shame. When Mumbai doesn't allow building, the whole city gets trapped in a, in a malfunctioning uh, state, which is tragic for India. Um, let me end with one final anecdote. Um, this gentleman, no friend of cities, uh, is, um, went out for a picnic in, I think it was 1844, in the woods outside of uh, Concord. Uh, that's a picture of, of Walden Pond, which was near those, those woods. Um, there was, he went out fishing, and there was good fishing uh, that day because there hadn't been rain in a while, so it was fairly easy to get at, get at the fish. But the lack of rain also meant that the grass was pretty dry. 
And he cooked a chowder, and there was a wind about, and the wind whipped the flames from his little fire to the nearby grass. The fire spread, and, and by the time the great fiery conflagration was done, over 300 acres of prime conquered woodland had been burned to a crisp. This man is seen as a patron saint of, of American environmentalism. Okay? This man who did far more damage to his environment than any Boston merchant or man of industry right, is, uh, you know, is, a, is a person who did a huge amount of damage to the, to the woods outside of Boston. There's a lesson here. Okay? We are a very destructive species. If you love nature, stay away from it. <laughs> And the final, the final note on this is this is a, this is a, a map showing carbon emissions by, by space. And certainly I have nothing to add to any, any debate on global warming. But it is certainly true that if, if you actually think that it's you know, important to reduce emissions, that city living is one of the, you know, city living is certainly significantly greener, despite the absence of trees, uh, than living in low density areas like, like that. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for atten your attention. Thanks so much, Ed. I'm Howard Husick, Vice President for Research here at the Institute. We've got some time for Q&A. I wonder if I could just start off. Um, the late Senator Moynihan annually used to commission a report, I believe, by the Taubman Center for State and Local Government at Harvard, which Ed uh, directs, that tracked the extent to which New York City spent, sent more money, not spent more, sent more money to Washington than it re got back in return, which suggests a question. Would New York or any of the cities that you uh, write so fondly of in the book be better off as a city state? <laughs> um, well, it, it, it's uh, the geopolitics of uh, New York being uh, a separate country certainly are a little bit scary. Certainly many of New York's mayors have oddly thought that their business is not, as Mayor Daley once said, to take out the trash, but rather instead to have their own independent foreign policies, as say, for example, Mayor Lindsay did. And I'm not so sure that it would be such a great thing to allow all of New York's mayors to be going around in their own, uh, their own, their own foreign policies. But that being said, um, certainly many city-states like Singapore have proven that smart people concentrated in a small area of land are capable of doing a lot even when they have no hinterland. And certainly New York has, has given a tremendous amount to, uh, to the country. I think the other uh, subtext in, in your question, of course, is how much federal policy, how difficult federal policy makes it uh, for, for cities like New York. And there's sort of a, a curse of Thomas Jefferson that hangs over this country where um, despite the fact that you know, his vision of the future didn't remotely come to pass, still this image of you know, America as being best served by yeoman farmers living in sub suburb suburbs surrounded by white picket fences, that's still with us. Of course, it's aided and abetted by the fact that the Senate give, tends to give a lot of political power to places that don't have a lot of land relative to people. Um, but there are a number of, of major federal policies, perhaps the home mortgage interest deduction above all, which tends to push people away from urban apartments to towards uh, suburban home owning, from the federal transportation policies that have artificially engaged in sprawl, artificially pushed sprawl. The work of Nathaniel Baum Snow at, at Brown shows that each new highway that was put in as part of an interstate highway system reduced urban population by 18%, 18%. Um, which is really quite, quite astounding. Um, and of course, our system, and this is not a federal policy, but certainly as we think about the challenges that cities place and the importance that education has, the incredible difficulty of the way that we structure our school system uh, creates huge challenges. And you know, it's, cities are capable of doing such amazing things when their virtues of competition and innovation are let free. But instead of allowing those in education, we've handed them over to a local public monopoly Right? And certainly Joel Klein worked very hard against this, and I have enormous admiration for what, for what he tried to do. But the basic structure loses everything that cities do that's, that's good. Think about what would happen if we handled all food over to a single New York City canteen, and every meal that you had in New York was put forward by some superintendent of foods who designed your, uh, your food. We would have killed a great industry, and I think we may have done the same thing with, with our schools. I thought that's what Michael Bloomberg is doing now. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, uh, questions. Uh, DeRoy Murdoch, come back. Thank you. Thank you very much, DeRoy Murdoch with the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. Uh, I think you may have touched on this a little bit in your last uh, comment, but I'm wondering, notwithstanding this gathering this evening, and in spite of the entrepreneurial spirit you described in a lot of cities, 
Uh, American cities seem to uh, vote uh, more left-wing, uh, whereas the uh, rural and suburban areas tend to be more uh, pro-market, at least ideologically, in terms of their voting behavior. Is that a new phenomenon, and is that an American phenomenon, or would you see this in uh, overseas uh, cities versus rural areas as well? Well, it, 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 isn't, it certainly isn't unique to America, but it, it's also true that in many um, other countries, actually, that, that at least what we would sort of think about as being economic conservatism is certainly more prevalent in urban areas, right? That certainly, there's not a lot of you know, classical liberalism in rural India, at least, that I've ever been exposed to. And in fact, in, in India, the, the you know, desire of, the, of cities to actually you know, make themselves better are often you know, stymied by the fact that the states have enormous control over what happens, uh, what happens in cities. Um, you know, I think this is one of the, the remarkable things, right, that nowhere is the power of competition and innovation more obvious than in our cities, right? And if you go back to the dawn of America, right, Hamilton was the urbanite, Jefferson was the you know, rural farmer, right? Um, and yet, oddly, the politics have actually gotten switched. And I think it's sort of one of the, one of the hopes is to, to make, the, make the case for at least a more open view of the values of, of competition and, and innovation, even, even for people who live in, uh, live in cities. That's blinding. Uh, uh, yes, on this. Uh, Julia Vichillo Martin. Um, thanks, Ed. That was, like, great. Um, I wonder if you'd elaborate a little bit on what was sort of a throwaway line um, about um, cities and the Industrial Revolution and this being an aberration. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what you think about um, the decline of manufacturing in cities and does this matter or doesn't it matter and, you know, is this just something that happened and we shouldn't worry about it anymore, or should we? Um, no, obviously we're still, we're still dealing with it. And it certainly, it certainly matters. Where's, it, where's a good picture to illustrate your, uh, oh, there, that's, that's good. Uh, it, it certainly matters. It certainly is huge. And, and America is still dealing with a hangover from the fact that we built our cities around large factories. Um, they were enormously powerful. And they're yet another example of, you know, I mean, Ford's, Ford's car factories was another example of how an urban innovation can actually create a lot of upside, despite the fact that cars ended up being uh, difficult for, uh, for cities. Um, but, you know, I think, I think the view that there's a manufacturing future for cities, I think, is wildly implausible. And um, that it's, it's very hard to imagine that any city is doing itself any good by thinking that manufacturing will return. Manufacturing tends to be fairly space intensive. It's not a good fit for, for cities. It doesn't actually require the idea flows that are so central to, to urban areas, to what urban areas deliver. So, uh, you know, I, I think this is sort of a larger scale thing that America needs to think about, you know, a future that's, that's you know, based around ideas and innovation. And as we think about it, we need to worry about how the, the next wave is going to do a better job of employing people with less education. And I think one of the reasons why I think cities will be so important for, for America's economic regeneration is that cities have a remarkable track record for allowing people with less human and physical capital to work together with people who do have, you know, an entrepreneurial bent, who do have assets, and becoming more productive as a result. I mean, think about, you know, the Kennedy ancestors coming to, you know, leaving impoverished rural Ireland, working as a cooper in uh, Boston, assuredly hired by some entrepreneurial brewer. Boston has a good track record of those. Um, but the, the, you know, this combination, and I think that's why it's, it's so important that, you know, cities are, are unfettered, are allowed to grow, because it's by growing more, it's by um, enabling the expansion of, of housing stock, that we enable people who are, you know, less educated, who currently, you know, four in ten adults with, without high school degrees are employed in this country, less than four in ten. Sixty percent of, of adults with poor high school dropouts are not in the labor force, as opposed to 70 percent of college graduates. The unemployment rate among high school dropouts is 15 percent. The unemployment rate among college graduates is less than five percent. We've got a, a jobs problem with the less skilled. And I think cities have a great track record at, at working at that. So um, that's, I think, one of the many reasons why cities are so important for America's economic future. Uh, Jim Epstein. Yeah. Hang on for the microphone. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, though, the ways in which new technologies might be challenging some of the advantages that places like New York have. I mean, 
you know, will there be much of a publishing industry in New York in a decade from now? Uh, trading stocks on the uh, floor of the New York Stock Exchange doesn't matter. And to what extent does our prized finance industry uh, remain here, partially because it's more crony capitalists than capitalists that we, you know, we're propping up existing firms and uh, protecting them? I have a very strong view that new technologies are, are actually good, not bad for cities. And we can talk about a couple of different different reasons why, why I think that. But the main theory uh, that I have, the main reason that I believe that is that I believe that what new technologies do is they increase the returns to being smart and that you actually need face-to-face -face contact as well, that no matter how good we get with various forms of electronic communication, we still have evolved over millennia, over millions of years, to uh, to be able to learn from people who are right next to us. And the more complicated the messages get, the more complicated the technology gets, the more important it is not to screw up the communications, not to actually be face to face. And there are things like trust that you know, work really much better uh, face to face than outside it. Right? It's not as if there's anything about publishing that needs to be here in terms of the actual production of the books but the connection between editor and author and agent and between other editors, so much of this relies on the, the information-rich meeting of people face-to-face. -face. You know, we thought, for the same logic, people thought that things like faxes and the internet would kill business travel, that, you know, we just could have meetings that occurred over long distances using, you know, various forms of, of technology. Business travel soared after the introduction of these, these technologies because they helped create a more connected world and they cre helped create a more in information-intensive world. Just a couple of other you know, key facts to keep in mind. Right? Uh, the old, all the literature that I know on electronic connections suggests that electronic connections and face-to-face -face connections are as likely to be complements as substitutes. They're as likely to go together. People who actually phone each other are m much more likely to live close to each other than live far away because you're using the phone in order to help your connections. Across countries, you know, urbanization and various forms of technology usage go together, even either controlling for, even controlling for incomes. And of course, the most famous example of a geographic cluster in today's, in the country today, Silicon Valley, is also in the industry that has the best access to, to new forms of technology. And I think the reason for that is that this is an industry in which it's just enormously valuable to have access to, you know, the knowledge that drops off of the workers around you, that young people in this industry, young software engineers, think it's vital to be in the middle of the action because that's where they learn to be successful entrepreneurs, to be successful um, producers of, of new ideas. So uh, I don't think cities have anything to fear from these technologies. I think it just mistakes the enormous value that being around other people and being face-to-face -face has and mistakes the enormous power that we, that we have. Um, and, you know, no matter how much you know, I think I have a line in the book, which is no matter how good technology gets, you know, there's never going to be a, you know, no matter how good Facebook is, there's never going to be an electronic substitute for sharing a meal or a kiss or a smile, right? And those are just very special things that face-to-face -face contact makes possible and that cities make possible. He refuses to be pessimistic. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, uh, yes, on the left, next. Uh, Look. Victor Rodwin, NYU Wagner. Hi, Nathan. I, you've written a provocative piece, I don't remember when, about New York as a healthy city, I think last year. Well, what is it that makes New York healthy, and why has health care improved in New York, in your view? Is it the income effect? Is it the role of local government? No. Uh, no. <sighs> that, that, you got, that's where I wanted to go, yes. Uh, well, you know, the, the reason why I continue to be optimistic, I just wanted to respond to Howard's line, is that this was my base. This is, this is what I remember New York being like. And given that we are where we are now relative to here, I, I sort of, anything that we're facing right now seems like small potatoes relative to, relative to that. On, on the health issue, it's a remarkable thing, right, that New York life expectancies are now about two years higher than the nation. That is a remarkable fact. If we go back to the start of the, 20, of the 20th century, a boy born in New York could expect to live seven years less than a person in, in the nation as a whole. Um, did that, you know, was government involved? Yes. It was involved most of all in terms of clean water, right, which had a huge impact. It was also involved in things like street cleaning, which were actually fair. I mean, George Waring, right, uh, you know, big hand in terms of getting the streets, streets clean, big impact on, on uh, health in, in the city. 
But I think if we look at, and you know, health also benefited by public interventions like the decrease of murders over the past, over the past 20 years. If we look though at today, why New York is healthier, I'm not sure I completely understand it among, let's say, middle-aged people between 65 and 80. Um, but among, you know, striplings between 25 and 45, it's fairly easy to actually see in the data what's going on. And the two largest causes of death for people in that age category are accidents, mostly motor vehicle accidents, and suicide, both of which are just much lower in New York, um, and much lower in cities in general. And, and with motor vehicle accidents, the, the effect is just very clear, right? Taking the bus while tipsy is just nowhere near as dangerous as driving drunk. Right? And it's just, you know, it's, there's just a straight health benefit uh, of this. Um, suicides are, are more fascinating. I have, I have worked on suicides and, and cities. And um, it is certainly true that, you know, uh, the low-density areas in this country have enormously high levels of teen suicide. One hypothesis, which does appear to be borne out in the data, is that this has something to do with very high levels of gun availability in these, in these cities. That actually, if you look, so that what I've done is looked across uh, counties and looked at the relationship between hunting licenses and, um, and, and suicide among the youth. It's a very strong relationship, and it's backed up by a large psychological literature on this. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not expressing any opinion on, on gun control. I know enough not to wade into issues that are not my core issues. But at least that's, that's one of the, you know, that, that's, that's at least one of the, the plausible explanations, at least for the young. Um, and among the, you know, uh, among the old, it's, it's, I think we're still trying to, stri to, trying to straighten it out. It's, it's little, there's very little evidence that actually, um, you know, public health interventions or, or the hospitals make a difference. Lifestyle choices are surely much more important. And it, it, it's hard not to imagine that exercise and even social contact doesn't play a large role, large role in it. So. Please join me in thanking Ed Glazer. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.